everyone and welcome to today's webinar, um, Make Your Donors Fall for Your Next Fundraiser. First of all, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day out there. I um, hope you guys are having a good one. Uh, lots of pink and red in your world, wherever you're at. Uh, but we're thrilled to be here today and uh, to talk all about event fundraising and, and how to make your donors fall for your next fundraiser. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items uh, before we get started. All attendees are going to be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, we're going to be distributing a recording of the webinar uh, with a, or just a YouTube link uh, shortly after it's over, probably uh, within the next 24 hours or so. If you have questions, we definitely want to hear them. So go ahead and put them. There's a little um, questions panel over on the side of the GoToWebinar that you can uh, submit questions. Please uh, submit them at any point during the webinar, but we're going to uh, reserve uh, some time at the very end to answer all of them. So uh, if, if questions comes up, Put it in there, and Renee and I will be uh, answering those at the very end. Uh, you can live tweet us at WinspireMe uh, or at AuctionChamp with the hashtag Fall for My Fundraiser. We'd love to hear from you during the webinar. I'd like to welcome today's guest, a very, very special guest that we're very honored to have. Uh, none, none other than the Renee Jones, a professional benefit auctioneer uh, from National Fundraising Solutions. Welcome, Renee. Thank you so much, Ian. I love how you say the Renee Jones. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking about myself. <laughs> And third person, happy Valentine's Day. Will you be my Valentine? Renee, I would love to be your Valentine. I love it. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to this webinar. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate and having the conversation about how to make donors fall for your next fundraiser. Absolutely. Renee here is a uh, industry titan when it comes to benefit auctioneer, uh, auctioneering and just uh, event fundraising in general. She has an incredible amount of knowledge uh, that we're very excited to show, share with you all here today. So um, let's go ahead and get to it. But before we do, uh, let's t talk a little bit about where you come from and National Fundraising Solutions. I couldn't believe this stat that you shared with me when we were working on this yesterday. Uh, $60 million per year raised for nonprofit causes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, it's very exciting because when you and I were discussing this and you and you asked me an initial number, uh, you know, I, I feared that that might be too high. And then it actually ended up being too low uh, for 2017. We, we average about that. But what's interesting is that our, our median event typically runs 50 to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in our live auction and our ask. Many of our clients engage us. Uh, in me in particular, is to have the conversation of how to educate board members, volunteers, donors, and really work to defibrillate special events that may have reached a level of the, they're not they're no longer gaining uh, revenue, but expenses continue to climb up. And so we work with clients from Cub Scout cake auctions to uh, some of our, our larger organizations, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And so, you know, on an average, you know, it's amazing. But when you have so many incredible nonprofit clients that we touch on uh, almost daily, uh, it, the numbers are incredible. And just, you know, an off uh, off from NFS's numbers is that when I was speaking at an AFP breakfast the other day, we had approximately 100 people in the room. And just in that group, uh, they had fundraised over $32 million in the last 12 months. And so we as professional wow. development leaders across the country, large and small, we are making a difference in our community, whether that's $25 or $25,000 or $25 million at a time. It, it, all, uh, it all makes a difference when we come together as a community for change. Absolutely, Renee. And I, I can't commend you enough for, for all the work that you're doing out there. Uh, it's just tremendous. And I actually think you were being a little humble there when you're talking about your average event size being, uh, you know, $150,000 uh, and above. It's, it's you, you're a part of events that are much larger than that, right? I'll know that you can do a million, two million plus in a night, which is incredible. Um, but that being said, a lot of what you're going to be talking about here today can, you know, work for any size event, large or small. Um, these are kind of just overall principles that uh, we discuss. So thanks again. We're going to get started here. Um, 
For those of you who aren't familiar with Winspire, Winspire puts together travel packages for your live and silent auction and raffle. They're consignment packages, so you only pay for them uh, after the event and only if you've raised money. Uh, we've raised over $50 million since 2008, been part of over 45,000 events, and satisfied over 86,000 winning bidders. We love what we do, and we love raising money. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with how it works, um, you can reserve any of our packages for free. Uh, you can promote them to your attendees, include them in your auction, and you can sell them as many times as you possibly can um, with no limit, and then you keep all the proceeds above the nonprofit cost. So it's a real effective tool for uh, improving your selection at the live and silent auction. I uh, wanted to announce as well that we're actually coming out, we've come out with uh, these uh, luxury properties that are actually specifically designed for the silent auction tables. They're lower price point hotel only packages, and uh, we're really excited about it. We uh, partner with preferred hotels and resorts, these really cool boutique hotels from uh, around the world, and uh, just some incredible packages in there. So definitely check it out. Uh, you can go visit them at winspireme.com backslash silent auction. So today, um, today's theme, right, is uh, making your donors fall for those fundraising events. Uh, just get them uh, very excited to, to come to your, hopefully your events coming up, maybe here in the spring. Uh, and here's the, the four main topics that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the guest experience, which Renee is all about and I think is, uh, is very, very important. Then there's the signing roles, event staffing, which is huge, a huge piece of any event. Um, how to request donations, uh, that's both you know, sponsorships, uh, auction items, uh, and at the event. And then finally, revenue streams of your event. We have everything uh, at your event needs to be focused on generating revenue. So we're going to talk a lot about where those streams come from. So uh, before we get into the meat and potatoes, I always like to start with a little interaction with our audience out there. Um, and I want to get uh, your answer to this question. Uh, and this will help Renee and I kind of frame what we talk about here today. How many people typically attend your main fundraising gala event each year? Uh, is it zero to 100? Uh, or I'm going to launch the poll. So is it zero to 100, 101 to 200, 201 to 300, 301 to 400, or 400 or more? So uh, go ahead and uh, and submit it now. All right. What do, you, what do you make of this, Renee? Oh, this is excellent. I mean, it's broad demographic, very representative of, of what my company does and my team works towards every day to ensure successful events. Um, and also every size event, whether it's large or small, it can be scalable up or down. So we may be discussing a particular topic and you know, even offline through email or telephone conversation, I'm, I'm more than happy to visit with an individual uh, development professional about this. But the idea is that uh, anything that we discuss today can be applied directly into an event of any size. I have another uh, uh, question that we're going to ask as far as the direct appeal goes. So uh, when do you perform your direct appeal, a.k.a. paddles up, fund a need during an event? Is it before, middle, or after the live auction? Uh, or do you not typically uh, do a fund appeal or, excuse me, a fund a need uh, during the event? And look at this. All right. What do you think about this, Renee? Well, I'm a strong <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really caught off guard that there are 22% of the audience that are not utilizing a direct appeal the night of the event. We'll touch on it later in our webinar, and I have some additional material that I can uh, send to you, Ian, and you can distribute to uh, our event guests today. Um, I'm, I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of each. Uh, I'm very happy that there's 20% that are, are seeing and understanding the trend and why we're doing it to the 18% that are conducting it in the middle of the live auction. I'd like to permission for a little extra time to talk about why that is not a best practice. And after the live, okay. auction, I'm going to share uh, it. There's there's ways to tweak this in each format to make it better. Uh, but I, I'm very happy to see that over 80% are conducting some form of a live appeal right. ask. And to the 22% that aren't, I'm going to share why you should. Right. I mean, we're going to talk a little more about this, but the direct appeal is one of the fastest and most effective ways to raise money as long as you frame it right. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And I'm going to do one more poll here. Uh, uh, because it's important to know how you guys frame your live auction. So how many live auction items do you typically um, have in your in yours, right? Do you not have a live auction? You have zero live auction items. You have one to four, five to seven, eight to 11 items, or 12 or more items. 
Um, this is, uh, you know, the fund and need and the direct appeal and the live auction, something that Renee specialize in uh, specifically, but also in the, the broader event. Uh, but this is an important uh, kind of pulse for us on the on the state here. So it's going to close the poll, share the results. Um, and that's good. I think that's a pretty good. I'm glad a majority of you are in the five to seven, eight to 11. Uh, I like to say kind of get as many out as you can in under like 45 minutes. And uh, that seems about right. Um, but 17% don't do live auctions. And that's one of the bigger, um, I would say second to right the direct appeal or, you know, sponsorships. It's one of the bigger revenue streams. We're going to talk about that a little later. Do you want to talk about this quickly, Renee, before we move no, on? No, we can move on. Cool. All right, let's get going. All right, so let's start with the guest experience here. This is such a huge part of any event, right? Uh, the moment they, it's not just about the moment they walk through the door, it's about everything leading up to it and then the event itself. So let's get into it. What are their expectations? Tell us a little bit about uh, how you coach your nonprofits that you advise out there, Renee, as far as guest experience. I think that the majority of our attendees today and that listen to this, re this recorded uh, broadcast uh, the expectations of a guest is a party. We're going to party. We're going to a fundraiser, not fund. They've lost the D in that conversation. Uh, the idea about controlling those expectations and getting them to merge with our reality is education. And it is educating not only our supporters, but also our corporate underwriters and sponsors and bringing them all to the same page. And how do we do that? It's through communication in advance of the event. Most everyone that is involved in this webinar today knows the blood, sweat, tears, and nausea that we deal with on the development side of having a special event. There's a lot of heartache and a lot of work that goes into it. And then you go to the night of the event and people perhaps are disconnected and not on the same page. Maybe there is a mission, vision, vision focus that has been missed. And so one of the things that we're going to touch on today is how to bring that into focus, bring them both together and to where we ultimately are reducing expenses, increasing revenue and securing long term supporters to our organizations. I love it. Yeah. And I love this graphic about expectations and reality merging, right? Because that's really what you need. Once they overlap like that at the time of the event and everyone's rolling, that's when the money starts flowing in. Um, so, you know, as we kind of touch on this guest experience, uh, I think it's important to talk about the types of guests that you have showing up in, in uh, at your event. And you like to split it up into three groups. Tell us about it. I do. I, I like to put it into three different groups, but I'd like to stress also is that the individual sometimes that needs the most new education, re-education is our top supporter. A top supporter is someone that is perhaps a board member, a former board member, a former gala chair, someone who is directly benefiting or providing services to the nonprofit organization. This is someone that's vested. They're a part of it 24-7, 365. They've circled their wagons, they raise money, they participate, and they are a part of your organization, an extension of your organization. The next guest is a guest of that perfect supporter. Now this could be that you have the perfect supporter who has purchased a table and now they're going to fill their table with their remaining eight seats. And so these are people that are typically like type and demographic and financial position as our top supporter. So this is a group that we really want to work to educate prior to their arrival to bring them into the vision and the mission of the organization to where they can advocate and feel comfortable the night of the event. Now, our third guest is a very difficult, it's like a chameleon, because a corporate <laughs> table could have the right people at the table, and it could also right. have not the right people at the table. And so one of the things that when we work with our corporate donors that as part of their package, they receive a table or more than one table, or perhaps uh, the corporate table, there, there's an honoree that's going to be seated at that table that is an active participant, perhaps a top supporter of our organization, but the rest of the attendees are not educated on the mission and vision of the organization, is that we have to ed educate them in advance but also to the point person or the person that's responsible for sharing the names of our guests is that I work with our clients to teach their teams how to learn more about who's attending their event, be it through social media, right. search, Google search, LinkedIn search, 
find out if the right people are sitting at the corporate table. You could have a table right off of the dance floor that's in direct sight of the MC and the auctioneer and all the fundraising activities. But if it's filled with support staff of that corporation or of that person's company, then it could, could be considered a dead table. And we may want to consider right. moving to another area. We don't want to give the premier real estate in our ballroom or our golf course tents, you know, or our school gymnasiums to people that are going to not be participating in our live ask and our higher end activities of the evening. And so much of that has to do with communication, right, and setting the expectation, right? When you're communicating with your corporate sponsors, making sure that you understand exactly who's coming, right, and what the expectations are uh, for that sponsorship table. It's very important from the very beginning to stress that this is a fund, F-U-N-D, Razor. The idea right. is that you have a silent auction, a live auction, an appeal, an ask, a raffle, whatever. We do, because you have to remember, I always look at a gala or any form of a nonprofit special event as a one day business. We do all mm -hmm. this prep work leading to it. And then that night is where we're accumulating. And many of us, I serve on multiple nonprofit boards. That night is make or break for my development team or my PTO volunteers as to set the goals and meet the goals and meet the expectations and financial responsibilities of the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. For those of you who've been to webinars before, you'll hear me talk about the one night only storefront. That's exactly the same thing, right? You're expected to raise that revenue one night. It's important to communicate what you were expecting. So um, as far as educating those supporters, right, those people, these three types of guests that are coming, how do you make sure that by the time they do get there, they know that it's a fund, F-U-N-D, Razor? I think it's very important to promote transparency, you know, whether we're under the watchful eye of Charity Navigator or a special investigator uh, reporter on television or a newspaper or a business journal, all of us are under the watchful eye of people within our communities to see that we're being fiscal responsible with the funds that we generate and raise for our organizations and our communities. And so I think it's very important to show that we are incredible stewards of the funds that we receive. So sharing current statistics. If you are in the education world and say your fundraising is associated with scholarships to ensure diversity uh, within the student body, then it's important to show the statistics of how many students receive scholarships the demographics of who makes up the student body. These are things that are very, very important that perhaps a parent or a community support or advocate may not even be aware of. And if they're sitting at a corporate table or they've been a guest of a, a parent and their children do not attend that school, then they definitely need to have a handheld and, and taken through the process of what makes or breaks the organization through the year. You know, if you're working in a mm -hmm. family shelter service, the idea is that you need to understand how many clients go through the doors, how many residents, how many people receive treatment. These are incredible statistics. One, they show that the need is never ending. And so our fundraising efforts are that night and then throughout the year. So the idea is that we're trying to educate and secure a new year-round supporter at our special event. The challenges, we know that in so many states. If you're tuning in from the state of Illinois or California or some other states that have uh, certain uh, financial instabilities within their own governments right now, is that you know that the challenges are individuals and private corporations are having to step up to secure funding to keep you afloat. And the goals for the future, you know, many people that are on this call right now have probably been experienced some form of natural disaster at some point in the in the most recent, whether it's Hurricane Harvey, Irma, et cetera, is that or the California fires or Montana fires is that we need to explain the goals for our future. Is that rebuilding? Is it resecuring funds that were depleted because of an exponential request and need and aid over these last several months. And so these are all things that we want to educate people in advance. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And how are we gonna be able to do it in the future? 
Love it. And I, you know, you hear so much, I hear this so many t times, right? Like make sure that you're sharing your stats, uh, keeping people educated. And it's, it's, it's about how often you're doing it, right? Every opportunity you get to save the date, right? Pamphlets that go out, just make sure it's at the forefront. Cause if people are armed, your supporters are armed with this information. It, it finds its way into the everyday conversation as you're talking about the event, you know, when the event gets there, by the time, you know, people are, are uh, excited about participating, right? They're going to have those stats in their back pocket that they can talk about and, and use and kind of perpetuate the, 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 you know, the feeling of donation that should happen. And also making sure that you make it in a presentation that's hopeful and, and, right. and positive. Uh, you know, there's, there's just too much negativity in the press right now and in social media is that you really want your organization to stand out as a, as a beacon of hope and security and, uh, and being an anchor within the community that you serve. Love it. All right, cool. We talked about cooperatives a little bit before, uh, just with that that group three guess. But you had a fabulous uh, little tip that you shared with me yesterday um, about how to kind of coordinate your your corporate tables uh, to get them to kind of more effectively participate. What, what was that? Oh my goodness! So everyone that's on this call that handles guest list understands that. We are all the master in no matter what accounting software or event software we're utilizing, that it would be Renee Jones and then Renee Jones guess one and then two, three, all the way through 10. So I have a corporate table purchased and then someone within your office is constantly harassing me for information. We look to bribe our corporate table sponsors now because we want that information early to where we can do data research and know who their guests are and why. You know, what are their financial abilities? Are they involved in other organizations? How do we show that uh, that we need them to champion our causes? Many things that we do uh, involve simple things as, you know, if you'll submit all 10 of your names, then you're going to be put into a drawing and the night of the event, we're going to draw a winner. And so that that's a great technique because typically we can find an item that's in the silent auction that could be marginal to success or no success and uh, and put that into now a raffle drawing with everybody that turned in their table of 10 information. Something that we've just typically I do not discuss and Ian knows this and people that are on this call who have heard my other seminars is I typically do not discuss techniques until we've reached like the hundredth event that where we've conducted it and we've deemed it to be successful. So last Saturday night we had an event and it was our hundredth time to do this. And so we believe it's, it's proven. It's about 95% successful with regards to activity. It's bringing VIPs into the event sooner is that what we do is once we have their guest names, we create, uh, table tents with the guest names on them and then we allow our VIP corporate table sponsor guests to arrive 30 minutes early and we allow them the opportunity to take that and actually set their table put their guests in the seats that they would like them seated at during the program and you think why is that important well one it's bringing uh, our more powerful financial uh, savvy people to the event sooner. It's creating a an immediate networking opportunity for them prior to a main guest arrival. It's giving them an opportunity if you're not using mobile bidding technology to get some early bids on the silent. But what we've noticed ultimately is from an operations standpoint is that we are able to get our guests into the ballroom and are and seated typically nine to 14 minutes faster. So it's allowing us to start our program on time or even earlier, because when people know where they're going to be seated, it's more organized, it's less chaotic. People are organized in their seats and ready for the event program to continue. So it's very important. And I, I have a little uh, sheet that I can send over to Ian, but there's little things that we do, whether it's games or internal ra raffles. Uh, but we work to bring our VIPs and our strongest supporters to the event, typically on average, 30 minutes sooner. So if we have a 7 p.m. start, we'd like to invite our VIPs to be there 6 to 6.30. Love it. All right, great. And um, we have a ton to get to, so we're gonna be moving right along. Uh, just a fair warning, we, we're probably gonna be going over an hour here today, but um, I highly encourage you guys all to stick around. So one common theme, um, you know, of our conversation that, that we had uh, over the last week, Renee, was uh, this idea of soothing guest anxiety. And it, it really falls in line with that whole guest experience here. Uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about what you mean. 
it's very difficult uh, when you are a new supporter to an organization, you're overcoming some obstacles. So perhaps you are an invited guest of another supporter, or perhaps you're a guest of a corporate table, or maybe you've made the investment and you've bought two individual tickets and you're going to go to this event. And the idea is that, you know, you're may not be fully aware of the organization. You may not be fully aware of the goals of the organization or the event itself. And so the idea is that everything that we can lay out in advance to a guest is very important to soothe their anxiety and get them into a mindset of, of giving and socializing and networking and rallying for the cause. Because what we're trying to do at these events, new and old supporters alike, is that we're re-educating and creating advocates for our organization that will work on our behalf as an extension of our volunteers or our development office or our executive director uh, when they're out in the community themselves. So the idea is that communication in advance of the event to eliminate any potential pitfalls or any negative experiences that they could encounter prior to the end of the evening. Right, because everything else is a distraction, right? And some a good example, right? And this is the, might seem so simple, right? But you said this is just kind of a common thing that uh, that people kind of oversee, right? Just signs to the bathroom. You know, it's it is on all of our post event uh, surveys. It it still to this day is the number one most important, most <laughs> asked question is that it's the difficulty to find a restroom in a venue. And so to me, when you look at signage and greeters and escorts, these are all simple solutions that can get someone outside of our program in our ballroom or in the tent to their to their, uh, you know, bio break and back faster and get them back re-engaged into the event and so that's very important now i know that we don't have a slide but something that i do want to address is with regards to valet and that's before the mm -hmm. bathroom because it never fails they need to go yep. to the bathroom when they get there but you know know in advance and be able to share with your guests many people in metropolitan areas you know spot hero there's all these different apps that you can utilize for self-parking but please share in advance from save the date on into all of your social media communications, all of your email communications. What are the options for parking? What are the fees associated with parking? Because it, that's something that will come back to you almost immediately upon arrival. Someone's seeking validation when there is no validation for valet or this, this and this. And so anything right. that you can get in front of them in advance again eliminates anxiety but you know when the pressure's on they've got to find the bathroom so have a person standing there or have a sign multiple signs very self-explanatory i know I, I love it i love the parking thing too because that's always kind of a question in my mind as you're kind of getting into the event and it's just you don't want to start them off with a bad experience of just you know parking their car and walking into the event you want it to be as seamless as possible so even, even if you don't have valet just very clear directions on where to park uh can just help a lot to get people in a you know easy going mood the last thing you want is a couple getting in a little tiff uh before they walk through the door because they're they're i guarantee you they're not going to spend as much money if uh if they're not having a great time so uh, just exactly get them in there. and for self-parking it's really important because we'll touch on it later with volunteers is you can reach out to different service organizations and they can actually help guide your uh guest into particular parking right. areas and it's just it's like going to a concert. If you know that you're going to park, get in and out. You you walk in and you're feeling good and you're ready, you know, for your first beverage and into, to enjoy the entertainment. It's the same thing Absolutely. at our nonprofit special events. That's great. Great. And this is, yeah, this is something that um, I think people are starting to come, you know, around on, um, especially with all the, the mobile bidding and, um, you know, bidding services that are out there now. They've improved dramatically over the last three or four years. And uh, this is a must have, I would say, at, at events because it, it, it eliminates so much uh, just upon entering the event. I agree. You know, one of the most important things for all of us to remember about mobile bidding technology and, and special event software in general is that, you know, if we were having this conversation 15 years ago, I would say that there's probably 70 percent of our current audience that couldn't afford it. Now, there are so many solutions that involve mobile bidding technology that are within any nonprofit or special events budget. But again, it's also like the valet and signage you know, software applications. These are things that also can be underwritten and actually utilized right. as a for the event. What's really important yep. 
for people that are not utilizing mobile bidding technology for their silent auctions is that when you have the ability to open your silent auction a week up to two weeks prior to your special yes. event when you walk in the night of the event you are normally at a number at or above what you would have anticipated at the end of the night but it's typically mm -hmm. higher and it's also eliminating a tremendous amount of distraction and stress of people trying to hover over bid sheets or again missing the mission and vision messages that we're delivering throughout the pre-function in the program because we're competing against them winning a basket of something and so you know the yep. message is more important than the basket of whatever that product is and so with mobile bidding technology we're also seeing a simpler express check-in because up to 60%, 70% of the guests in some situations have already pre-swiped their credit card. They're already engaged in giving prior to their arrival at the special event. And so they are already focused on the fund raising for that evening. And it's another great excuse. If you can open up the, the auction early and do some online bidding, it's a great excuse to promote the event, right? People are a lot more aware that the event's coming up. If you're, you know, posting links to auction items, really cool, kind of your featured items and getting people engaged. It's, it's just another, another outreach on your social media and, and email as well. Well, and also to touch on that is that with mobile bidding yeah. technology, you have the ability to set your big board and your live auction and even your fund and need fund emission paddles up program into a preview mode it will eliminate the need for a printed auction catalog at most events because people can immediately mm -hmm. reference in advance of arrival and throughout the evening they can read an extended description uh, that even as a professional benefit auctioneer i might not have time to read due to the number of items i need to clear in under a half hour Totally. Great. Okay, cool. Kind of looping back. We're almost done with this section. Uh, just kind of looping back on this, this idea of setting expectations just because it is so important. And I love this sentence that, that, uh, that you gave me here, right? Everyone should, should know there will be an ask and why it matters. I'm going to repeat that. Everyone should know that there will be an ask and why it matters. It's amazing how many organizations uh, maybe don't realize that they're failing to do this. It, it is, it's, a, it's a simple miss. And I would say that when I, I receive a tremendous amount of invitations to nonprofit special events, and I attend many as a guest and as a supporter when I'm actually not working, which is very refreshing to see it uh, from the <laughs> other side of the table. It's rare, but I there are certain events that I don't want to miss. And I know there's several people on this call that I attend their events and uh, they always appreciate the post-event audit, whether they ask for it or not. Because I just say, you know, we could do this. <laughs> Uh, but you know, the reason why everyone should know there will be an ask is that it shouldn't be a mystery that we need money. There is no shame in knowing that we can be professional beggars and do it in a very professional way and in an ethical way and in a transparent way. But from the first initial save the date to all social media communication to all emails is that there should be listed whatever your fundraising opportunities are. So if you're going to have a wine pool, you should share that you're going to have a wine pool. Why? Because if you've trained your guests properly, that wine pool should sell out 30 to 45 minutes after the doors open. So you want to create a sense of right. urgency for people to get to the event. Are you doing a raffle and are we going to draw it that night of the event? Again, limited ticket sales remain and you can buy your remaining tickets at the event. Bam, there's another low buy-in opportunity. Are we gonna play some games? I hope so. So if so, share that, because then that way they know there's going to be something for them to participate in. Because with most live auctions, there's incredible exclusivity, and it will basically prevent 90% of your audience on average from being able to participate. And so how do we engage them and show them there are many opportunities to support at all levels of revenue? And so it's just important. You want to communicate it. Am I going to have an ask? I'm absolutely going to have an ask. We're raising money for scholarships this year. We're raising money for a new playground. We're raising money for a new clinic expansion. Whatever it is that your goal is for your organization, we want to spell it out and define it. We want no mystery as to why we are raising money and where those funds are going. 
Love it. All right, just real quick, we're going to touch on this, the bewitching hour. Um, the kind of the main theme here I wanted to touch on is uh, just being aware of that alcohol bell curve, the alcohol consumption, because there is a perfect time to be doing that, uh, you know, direct appeal and, and live auction. Uh, what is your recommendation? You know, typically we try to get all the fundraising portions of our program completed prior to dessert. If it's a seated meal, if it is a heavy hors d'oeuvre standing noshing, then again, we typically are 45 minutes to an hour into the program. Those are usually shorter programs with a very specific ask and typically no live auction. For golf tournaments, we're already battling the buzz from them playing and drinking on the course. While many organizations do have cash bars, uh, it still means that your your guests are consuming alcohol. And if you have an event that's alcohol free, congratulations because your expense overall are typically one third less than your peers. And so yeah. that's important to yeah. remember. But to me, you yeah. look to having a signature drink upon arrival. You look to having past wine, typically in the pre-function area. I typically don't lend myself to having multiple heavy bars open if it's an event that's 400 and under. Uh, typically we can have bars in the room. We shut the bars down sometimes during certain portions of the program based upon the audience noise level. Uh, if we know an audience is just typically inclined, which some school clients are, it's just the nature of it. Parents getting together without their kids, they're going to get boozed up and have a lot of fun. Is that, you know, mm -hmm. we look to ways to, to break that up because ultimately there is also a liability to the nonprofit organization. Of, of, a, of a guest supporter being overserved. So we have to be mindful to all of that. And also just always be mindful also to uh, have an Uber account set aside for an event like that. And, uh, and that yep. way you can always put them in or have a, a yellow cab sponsorship. I know in Houston in particular, they've always been very good advocates to my nonprofit clients that if someone is in a position and shouldn't be driving, never hesitate to stop them, save a life, save a parent and, uh, and get them home yep. safe. I love it. That's all great. Great. Okay. So moving on, we're going to talk about assigning roles and event staffing. There's some, some great tips that, that Renee has here, and that, that's going to start with recruiting your VIPs. And this was one of the biggest things that I learned um, just in my conversation with you over the last week and how important this is and how effective it can be to enroll or in, enlisting the rest of the rest of your guests, right? If you have your VIPs well positioned and, and well poised to, uh, to be socializing and, and recruiting those guests. You know, it's very important. And I touched on it earlier with regards to, you know, arriving early, being able to have that first peek at the silent auction if you're not utilizing pre-event bidding opportunities through technology. But the idea is to give them perks, you know, for them to be able to put down, you know, their guest names on the table and have their, their tables set and ready for the evening. It's very important, you know, based upon the demographic and audience that we have at our events, what their expectations are and what level of service they expect from us. But, you know, with VIPs, you know, I look to board members, previous chairs, board members, I always ask them to wear their name badges. We all have magnetic back name badges and, and wear them the night of the event. It's important to be able to share that uh, the night of the event with them, because the idea is that they are an extension of the organization. They know what is going on in the day to day uh, operations of the organization, and we don't want them to get dinned up. It's really about the development team visiting about what are the goals that night, maybe assigning a board member or two tables to actually engage and visit with guests at that table, uh, having a photographer take the board member's picture with those table guests. There's all these different things that can be taken care of and, and done. But the idea is that we want our VIPs and best supporters to help alleviate anxiety for new guests. We want them to be an outreach to the organization and we want them to be able to provide answers uh, in the absence of, uh, of a development leader or an event manager uh, at least be able to direct them in the right direction to be able to get the specific answers they're seeking. Many times they can reach to me as an auctioneer or an event planner or uh, an event manager. Again, we're all very well. The idea is that you want them to be uh, easily recognizable. So I see this I slide. That. The board engagement letter is very, very important. It's something that um, we started, oh gosh, probably 17, 18 years ago. And the idea is that 
with this is that the night of the event, you know, the development team and the executive director should not be handling the mundane mechanical things. That's another reason why I said, you know, it's important to have our board members there early. You can bribe them with a photo opportunity to get their new headshots uh -huh. done. Like, there's That's all great. these different things. And I have a great uh, board engagement bribe list. And so feel free to email me <laughs> I'll send it to you uh, because it's important and, and it gives them the, the ego moment there's a lot of hard work serving on a board. I, I again, I serve and I, I know there's nothing exciting about what we do, but it's important to the long term goals and short term goals of the organization. But, you know, look to them to be socializing, you know, board engagement, give them specific roles the night of the event, very specific, look to their strengths and weaknesses. If they know the majority of the guests that are going to be in attendance, then you want them to be at a, a greeter at check in. You want that to be their role. If they're newer board members, have them with a mentor older board member and have that older board member introducing them to their network. Again, it's re about reassuring and reinventing the engagement of the board member at the event. Too many times they show up, they take care of their eight guests, and then they leave and that's it. And they need to understand, and I believe it's the next slide, is understanding yep. the night of and the engagements. And so, you know, giving them those specific roles. But also that's really important prior to is understanding, you know, what makes a board member tick? What are their strengths and weaknesses? And reach out to your executive director or to the president of your board. And you know from your position in development and special event leadership, who can you approach? Who do you have a good relationship with? And who do you as a development professional need to work to kind of vet out that information and find out who they are and where their strengths and weaknesses are and how you can put that to the advantage of the organization at a special event? I love it. Yep, they should be out there socializing. Quick note, you're going to see these uh, little yellow things. Those are We're actually going to be sending those out in, a, in an email with the recording. So um, you'll get all of this from Renee, which is uh, incredibly generous, generous of her to share her knowledge out there. Uh, but it's going to be a great, uh, great resource for you to get your board engaged and a couple other things coming up. Um, and this is all in the same vein, but uh, I know most of you out there are development directors or executive directors or maybe event chairs, but you should be out there talking to your guests, right? So that's why it's so important to hire somebody um, or put somebody in the position of right a production manager and getting your board and, and everyone involved uh, so that you can go around and socialize. Tell us a little bit about what you recommend for that production manager. Well, I think it's very important to, again, in, in looking at the demographics of who have joined us for today's webinar, is that it's representative across the industry in, in a nice mix. And so what we have to look at is that if we are doing a event for you know a, an individual and 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 uh, you know working on cancer treatments is that even then if you're the organizer of this you need to be front and center as an ambassador and welcoming people you need to turn to one to two friends and have them understand you know if they're put them in charge of they're the silent auction manager or put them in charge of finding the auctioneer and making sure they're on the stage at the right time or what time does the band start having a, a very simple timeline and outline to your event you know when i look to larger um, events then again i look to a production manager being somebody that is in, in the associate development office someone that is in accounting someone that can handle certain things check in check out questions with regards to, uh, you know, tax compliant invoices and, and receipts. There's all these little weird things that pop up the night of the event. Have your best athletes in those areas to handle those potential situations. It's very important that this is not something that you do the night of the event. And for parents totally. that are chairing school events, this is very important. You are a chair, you have a co-chair, you have other officers within your PTO. It's obvious your treasurer is going to be overseeing the check-in and check-out process. It is obvious that your solicitation and outreach committee needs to be involved with the silent auction and the live auction areas and ensuring that that is running smooth. Your goal, again, is about thanking people that have underwritten, sponsored, and taken and made the time investment to be at the event. Yes, thanking your major donors, people who have already donated or are, are going to, absolutely. Um, the, and we're going to talk a little bit about volunteers here, and, and you have a great volunteer questionnaire that we're going to be sending out, but what do you recommend as far as vetting volunteers? Because everyone has different strengths. You touched on that a little earlier. How do you make sure that uh, you use people's strengths uh, to the advantage of the event? 
you know what, it's, it's very important to understand the demographics of the people that are attending your event. You know, if we're on a golf course and we know that we have raffle sales and, and a drink cart and other things that need to be manned, then I would be reaching out uh, to service organizations, sororities, fraternities, you know, cheerleading groups and things like that, individuals, young, younger adults that need service hours or are committed to some form of community service through their professional uh, position in their job. And so, you know, you look to that. So from that point, like when I have an event and I'm looking to find volunteers for it, then I say, hmm, where are my weaknesses? Who am I looking for? You know, if I need people that are going to sit behind a computer and welcome guests and pre-swipe their credit card, then I need to find more social, outgoing, and energetic millennials to do that, that are tech savvy, that can work on the fly and follow directions and work well as a team. You know, when you look to raffle sales and things like that, again, it's, it's, it's strengths and weaknesses. If I know that through my questionnaire, that my volunteer, you know, has a degree in finance and works in an accounting firm, then most likely if I'm doing manual bidding sheets, I'm going to put them in charge of some form of data entry or auditing associated with that. The worst thing that you can do is have a volunteer make their time commitment and you not utilize and appreciate them the way they should be appreciated. So the way to, to tee them up for success and secure their success, which ultimately translates into our financial success, is to find their strengths and weaknesses and vet them in advance of the event. Love it. Uh, you talked about getting volunteers. Where do you recommend uh, getting them? You know, I love to look to my universities. I look to non-traditional students. I look to uh, service organizations. And I also, I look to even other business associations uh, that have a charity foundation outreach as part of their mission and vision. Many banking, financial institutions have volunteer programs. Um, many accounting firms, real estate firms have outreach programs as well to where you are bringing, again, a like type mirrored demographic to your event attendees. And so, again, it's about alleviating any form of anxiety of the guest. And so it's good to see other professionals volunteering their time to where guests can enjoy their overall experience. Love it. Yeah, you mentioned sororities as well. It's kind of a good good place because I think they all have kind of mandated um, hours they have to donate, right? They do. And, you know, some people have that when I have made the suggestion, especially for some of my school events, to have um, scouts and to have high schoolers and things like that, they, they're like, oh, my gosh. You know, as long as you do not have the, you know, based upon uh, statutes and, uh, and, and sometimes venue restrictions, as long as you don't have them in the, in the function area where there's alcohol being served, you don't have a problem. But the main thing, again, is that these are youthful, energetic people that want to contribute. And what a better way to recruit long-term volunteers and very early investors in your organization is to grab them at the high school and college level because typically yeah. those are who, who you nurture or who your next generation of supporters are going to be. That's great. Moving right along here, this was another huge nugget, uh, especially for all you uh, people out there uh, who are joining us here today from schools. Uh, I love this idea of cross-pollination. Tell us a little bit about that. This started with my firm about 25 years ago, and in, it started because one of my girlfriends was co-chairing an elementary school event, and it, it just... I had watched her and worked with her for nine months leading up to this event, and then the night of the event, she is in a beautiful dress and crawling underneath a desk looking for an extension cord to plug in, and I was like, this is insane. So when the event was over, she... It, it was almost like postpartum. It just, there was such an incredible disconnect. She didn't get to enjoy and celebrate this amazing uh, record-breaking fundraiser that she had been a part of with her team. And so at that point, I just vowed I was going to figure out a way to make this better for parents. And, uh, and so what we developed was a program to cross-pollinate between schools. And so based upon uh, the school district, uh, faith, uh, geographic location, you know, we worked with different schools and continue to do so as to uh, parents from one event 
that will come and work the check-in, check-out, and basically work to train their team for their, you know, to better themselves for their event with regards to solicitation. It gives a parent an opportunity to see another event without the expenditure of tickets and dresses and things like that. And it also makes them better in understanding how other events operate. So to me, a yep. uh, parent to parent swap. So the idea is that my event is on the first Saturday night of March. I am working with a team of parents at another school. They're going to do my check-in and check-out and fulfillment of silent auction items. Then the following Saturday night, I'm going to work their school event. And what it does is it'll, it eliminates a, a tremendous amount of cost. And again, mirrored demographic of volunteers to guests and, and also some cohesion between software products and sometimes even themes. For years, I had a warehouse and we literally, I had every theme because some schools had incredible budgets. And so they do all new set design through their class or high school, you know, um, design, you know, theater uh, group. And I had other schools that had no money for budget, you know, to go to Party City and spend $25 was a huge undertaking or a parent had to pay for it themselves. And so we swapped out themes as well. So again, it's really about visiting with your peers at other schools, within your districts, within your regions, and seeing if you can work on doing something like that. And it doesn't have to be specifically to a dinner or a gala. It can be a fun run. It can be a golf tournament. But again, it's really about just empowering parents to be able to help each other and ultimately raise the revenue with their child's event. Totally. And I, I can guarantee you that other parents out there uh, who are volunteering and, and putting on these events have the exact same challenges that you do. So if you're worried about how receptive they may be, uh, don't be. Because if you, you know, uh, propose something that is going to save them time and, and you know, help them uh, with their event, I, I guarantee you they're going to be all ears. Oh, it, it's, it's amazing. And it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, moving on to the next section, requesting donations. This is a big part of, of any event, not only just uh, requesting donation items, uh, but also sponsorships and the like. So uh, tell us a little bit about, and this is one of my favorite topics, talking about ROI, return on investment. It's kind of getting into thinking more like a business when it comes to your event. Um, and and tell, tell me a little bit about uh, how that is perceived by donors. You know, I actually teach a seminar to donors through different business associations and organizations. And it's it came about very organically because I was experiencing with many of my clients, there was not a return of donor. It'd be like a one-time donor, or maybe they donated for five to seven years and then they dropped out. And the problem was is that we didn't know where they were going or why. And so we really started working on developing programs that took the donor through the steps of education with regards to the organization again mission vision why their donation was important and then following up with them post event in different ways to where they see a return on investment in their dollars you know we all knock on the doors of local businesses and they they have to see you know what is coming back to them from the organization and so you know from the committee standpoint I have always encouraged uh, members of the committee to thank donors when they visit their businesses, making sure that they visit with the manager or they drop off a personal note. Because the idea is that if somebody donates a, a $100 gift card and it's very good for them to know who bought it, how much they pay for it. These are all very fair questions. And so, right. you know, that, that, that ties on to some of our revenue streams that we'll talk about in a few slides. But, you know, for me, it's really about how do I make my cause and my organization stand out to that donor to where they'll stay invested in me. And it also translates into what we touched on earlier with regards to the guest experience is that the idea is that right. for the donor, we want them to be invested in the organization, even though they're not attending the event typically. We want them to know, again, what is the money being raised for? What have we done with the money previously raised from donations that they have been a part of and attributed to the success of previous events? Again, showing them the return on investment, not only in their initial investment. Now, this could be a parent that has donated a home or a business that's donated. It doesn't matter. Individual, family, business, foundation, all the same. Again, about educating them and having multiple touches. A solicitation letter is not enough in today's age.
because your solicitation letter will go on a stack with 500 others. Yes. Yes. And uh, speaking of letters and thanking your donors, you touched on it here. I think this is such a crucial part of, you know, showing donors their return on investment when they make a donation. And this is a template that we're going to be sending out along with the recording of the webinar. But tell us a little bit about this letter that you, and this is a simplified version, mind you, but how, how does this letter work? So it's very important. So how many of us as, as development professionals uh, send a generic thank you letter for a donation before or after the event? Most of us do. I hope all of us do. But I know from personal experience and things that I've donated, I have sometimes never received a thank you note, which is just mortifying to me on a development side. But let's talk about something that's unique. Uh, this is something that we developed about five years ago. And so when a uh, guest, a winning bidder, receives their certificate or their basket or whatever the item is, is that they receive a letter that is on our organization's letterhead. So that could be JDRF or Alzheimer's, you know, Poe Elementary, Child's Voice, whatever your letterhead is for your organization, you're generating this letter. So date of the event, name, address of the donor. You're going to personalize it to the donor. You're going to say, thank you for supporting this event with your donation of X. And then, then you have the bit winning bidder fill in their name. And you say, I'm looking forward to visiting with your business soon. Your continued support of, and then you, at that point, you put your organization name back in it. But the idea is that we have the winning bidder sign it in addition right. to development or an executive director sign it. And these are already with the certificates, with the tangible items, already with a 49 cent stamp on them, and they're ready to go. All that has to happen is we secure the winning bidder signature that night, put it in the envelope, and they all get mailed out. And the idea is that we just wanted to do something different. How many times mm -hmm. has a donor seen my name as the treasurer of an organization saying, thank you, appreciate you, yep. just for something different. Hey, I'm the winning bidder. And most of the time when someone buys, whether that's a restaurant gift card or a hotel or a vacation package, whatever it is, typically they already know the business owner. So it's just another fun way of reaffirming that, you know, to like for me, if I buy, I'll say one of my favorite restaurants, uh, you know, is uh, Bluegrass. And they are always very generous about $200, $250 gift cards. I buy them nine times out of 10 when I can win the fight in a silent auction for them. And then when I send a letter like this, then they know that's where I bring my clients. That's where I bring my family. And so again, it's year round support to that business. So it makes asking for another $250 gift card so much easier in nine months when I do it again. I, and I love this tip and you're doing, you're doing the work for the donor or the winning bidder, right? So they don't have to do anything, right? They just are filling in their name. They're excited to do it, right? Cause they want to kind of perpetuate this goodwill. And it, it just, it's an all around great way. And I loved this tip. This is great, Renee. It, it, it's something that's very different. It's something relatively fresh. I'm not aware of any other consultant business that does it. But again, I like to cast things out upon the water for free. You take it, use it, improve it, make it better. And then just let me know how it worked out for you, because the idea is that everything that I put forth in any of my seminars and in the webinar today, take it, personalize it, use it, improve it, and then be sure the only thing I ever ask is you share it with other development peers to where they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Love it. Love it. All right. And you wanted to share, too, uh, just some tips on the donation request forms. This is another template that we're going to be sending out. I think this is the last one. I believe this is the last one. Um, tell us uh, just uh, in a a short bit what do you recommend as far as donation requests you know, i really like to start with the solicitation committee and the board and so with the board and and we'll send out a letter that basically is a information sheet that we ask for board members each year and it's a very simple questionnaire you know uh, when you travel what airline do you fly what's your favorite city you know, where, what is your favorite restaurant? What, where hotel do you normally stay at? We, we're looking and we're tracking. We're trying to see where our board members like to stay, where they like to travel, where they like to eat. Those are good, solid foundations that we can integrate into our solicitation committee meeting and help hone in our donation request. I also typically conduct a very quick, usually two-hour brainstorming activity where we talk about all the components of a silent live and big board function for a special event and we start with just very simple and you can run this as a development leader for your own teams is that when you're sitting there with the committee and you say you know what you have a hundred dollars to spend on yourself what would you buy 
And it's interesting because I might say, well, I'll buy a massage. Or you might say, I'm going to buy tickets to the Children's Museum for my family. And so there's all these different things. There's no wrong answer. The idea is that as you come together, it's like, well, if you have $100 to spend, this is what I would do. If I have $500 to spend, this is what I would do. If I was going to take a major vacation with my spouse or partner or my family, where would I want to go? And then you can quickly see, you know, from your core supporters that are sitting in the room, where do they want to go? Because now in the meantime, from the board uh, survey, you know what airline they'd like to fly and what hotel they'd like to stay at. And so there's all these different yep. things that we put together. So then we're able to customize for each event. It's not each organization. Each event stands on its own with its own personality, whether it's a third party or an organization, organizational RAN event. And so the idea is that with those, you're sending out your solicitation team with a very clear focus and goal of what to reach out and get. And so to me, I think that empowers the development team, the executive director and the board members to also be able to solicit with power and not be timid in the process. I love it. It's going to have a strategy behind it. You're not just pounding the pavement, asking every single business. You're actually being strategic about the businesses that you're going and asking for. And you can kind of back up your request because you can say, hey, look, we asked our audience. We know that this is going to just sell like crazy and raise a lot of money. Will you please, you know, uh, contribute? And they're, they're a lot more likely to, to do something, take some action if they if you have data to back it up. Exactly. Great. Okay. And I know uh, we're at 11. We're hitting on an hour. I apologize again for those uh, those audio issues in the beginning. We're going to keep uh, cruising here. We have about six more slides, actually five more slides, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. So um, stick with us. We're going to we're going to get to these revenue streams here, which is uh, which is kind of the biggest part of the event. That's the whole reason we're here is to generate fundraising revenue. And I like to start with kind of a little fun one. Some of you out there might uh, might be familiar with it. This is something that Renee likes to do with gift cards, the giving tree. Tell us a little bit about that. You know, the giving tree, uh, you can call it Poseidon's Pond. You can follow any theme that might be able to work. But the idea is that, you know, most of our committees, we have the one individual that is like the master of securing gift cards. I mean, like I don't even understand sometimes where some of my team members can find all these gift cards and get them, but they do and they're awesome. And I would never stop them from doing and following their passion when it comes to bringing potential revenue to my organizations. So with that is that, you know, here we've got a stack of gift cards. Okay, what are we gonna do with them? So many times, you know, we can use them as awards to uh, solicitation teams for raffle, or we can use it in a drawing for a VIP that turned in other, all their 10 names. They want a drawing and they want a, a gift card. You know, just a little token of appreciation. You may have a, a comp competition between the volunteers with regards to data entry, guest entry, something where you recognize a specific volunteer. But in the end, you have gift cards. You can integrate them into different packages. Packages, but again, it kind of diminishes their importance to the local business that's given it to us. So with the giving tree, let's start with something very important that I do. I typically take a 5160 Avery label, which is a mailing label. And with that, I will put the event name of the organization and contact information for whoever it, within the development team or a volunteer that was in charge of the uh, silent auction or the gift card solicitation and then also the date of the event and with a thank you on that card because the idea is that when that card is redeemed at the business we want them to know where it came from and get, again just a little discreet thank you for your support and so also in addition and also in addition to that and it's a simple thing fits perfect on any gift card no matter yep. where it comes it fits so just do it it doesn't take you 10 minutes once you get the template set up again it's nothing to print them off and stick them but with a giving tree typically let's say that your average gift card received for your event was fifty dollars and in an ideal world we might we might get 50 for it on a silent table we might get 45 we might get 30 it may not be that popular it may have been missed and it only brings 25 half price you know we want to break the garage sale mentality when it comes to these gift cards at many events. And so the giving tree is basically a preset amount of $50. Let's say if our cards all average 50, for a $50 donation, you get to draw and you're guaranteed to win at least a gift, gift card worth $50. Now, we can also seed that with a grand prize, you know, uh, gift card that might be $100, or maybe there's some that are 60 or 80 or, you know, ever how it's built together. 
But the idea is that at minimum, your $50 donation is going to secure you a $50 gift card. And so why that's important is that you can also make a notation, you know, on your all of your $50 gift cards. You can also add into your little Avery label, sold for $50. And why is that right. powerful? Because as a small like bookstore owner or something like that, I see on a little gift card that I gave to an elementary school or I gave to a particular event is that it says sold for $50, the name of the event, maybe the website to the organization, and a thank you. Am I going to be more inclined to donate again to that organization knowing that they secured me 100%? My donation, my donation of that gift card really secured them 100% return. That's huge for them. Right. And so it's very mm -hmm. empowering and we want to share that. And so it's it, those are just some ideas with regards to the Giving Tree. The Giving Tree is just a great one-stop shop and it's something that guests enjoy. It's a low buy-in opportunity, a little game of chance. And, uh, and immediately it's something that they can put into their pocket and move on. That's great. That's such a great tip. And it, it's what, what you're so good at Renee is, is perpetuating that, that feeling of giving, right? It doesn't end at the event, right? It's the winning bidder when they get their prize, you know, most so often people just get their, their gift and that they won and then they go home and then they, they don't really realize what it's for, but it's, it's all about perpetuating it with not only your guests, but also the, the organizations and people who donated to the event and uh, recognition goes all around. And that's, that's super clever. I, I think it's a great tip. Well, I just think that it's very important and, and I work year round on it with all of my clients is that we want a, a multiple touch throughout the year to all of our participants, yep. large and small at our events, because someone that can start out as a, as a small donor can very quickly move into a large, larger donor position, you know, based upon uh, family changes, financial changes, just age. And, and also we may have a mission that, that the next year touches them even more. And so again, you know, we really just always want, I am a big mission vision focused person. And most of my clients now ask me not to call myself an auctioneer, but I started this industry over three decades ago and I love to be on stage. But at the same time, I also know that many of my events no longer have live auction components. We concentrate on the ask. And so when I look right. to all these other opportunities that happen the night of the event, my goal is a, a sole focus is of inclusion. I want every guest to feel and know that they're important to our community. That's great. Okay, a couple, uh, couple more slides here, and uh, just a few more. We're going to talk about just real quick the silent auction, then the live auction, um, and then just about how to hire a benefit auctioneer, and then we'll get to your Q and A here. So, um, as far as the silent auction goes, how many items do you recommend? We're, here at Winspire, we always preach half the number of buying units, right? So. Uh, if you have the buying units are kind of, you know, a couple, right? So two people equals one wallet. So if you have 200 people, that's 100 buying units and you want to go uh, at maximum half of that. So I would actually encourage less. So between 30 to 40 items uh, mm -hmm. for, for a 200 guest count, what do you, what do you usually recommend? We typically recommend 10%. So if we're going to have 500 yep. guests, we're at 50 silent auction items. We have other buy-in mm -hmm. opportunities. Technology does not change that. Uh, because the reality is, is that we still want to create a sense of scarcity, uh, create a sense of urgency, and we want to ensure that we create an environment of competitive giving and yes. that we want reality out the window when it comes to things like this. And many times if you're associated with client projects, if you work with adult programs where individuals have special needs and, you know, we have different pottery things and art projects or your child's school cookie jar or a terracotta coffee table, whatever it is, you know, the reality is, is that we want to create scarcity and we want it to be special. And we also want it to be a component of the evening and not the overwhelming part. Totally. Yep. And because silent auctions, I mean, as far as the amount of time it takes to, if you're talking about 50 plus auction items that you're putting out on these tables, think about the time and energy um, and expenditure it takes to put out those tables, package the items, organize the items, um, you know, uh, and, and offer them at the end of the night, right? Once uh, people have won them, it takes so much time and energy. Uh, very, and very looking at it as far as how much it generates. Yes. Go ahead. 
very labor intensive. And, and when you look at the return yeah. on investment from solicitation, that's why things like the giving tree and other uh, outright buy opportunities are so important because you're going to have a stronger return on investment for something like the giving tree. You have one six foot table, you know, in a silent auction, every 16 inches is a, another asset. And so to back that up, you have to decide what's that 16 inches worth. You know, I can't, I, I, sh I can't, shouldn't say can't, you shouldn't have an item that's worth three to $500 sitting next to an item that's 2,500. You've got to set some form of baseline that each package is going to be valued at or above X. Right. Yep. I'm seeing that more and more is that the more events I go to, the smaller and smaller the silent auctions are getting and the more they're spending on time, they're spending on, uh, you know, developing the live auction and also the direct appeal, which we'll talk about here in a second. So uh, live auction, and this is that one page board question that you touched on earlier, asking your board, like where they want to go, what would they purchase, uh, finding out you know, information before you go and try to procure items is so important when it comes to live auction. Uh, what, what do you recommend in terms of how many items and, and how to really get those good uh, packages? You know, I always ask my development leaders and, and special event leaders that, that are handling this is to look at the timeline and, and go backwards. I mean, the idea is that if you're paying for entertainment, whether that's a DJ or a band and they're under contract to play for, I'll say, three hours, the worst thing that can happen is you can have a live auction that runs an hour plus. I mean, when you look to a live auction, you're looking at assets, whether they are $50 items or $50,000 items, is that they should typically sell in two to three minutes per item. And so let's just say five items is 15 minutes, 10 items. You, you see very quickly, I'm at a half hour. We haven't even discussed the ask yet. And that typically involves a two to three minute video and then the auctioneer uh, making the request for bidder paddles or bidding straight into mobile bidding technology. And so for the live auction, you need to be mindful uh, of your guest time and fatigue because live auctions typically have exclusivity that will cut out you know 80 90 percent of your audience they won't even get the first bid in so you have to look at how do i entertain them and keep them engaged and so again it's about keeping things in a very quick concise fashion of selling and keeping the energy level high throughout the night uh, but again i look to the end of the night and then i back it up if i'm supposed to be done at midnight and you've paid for a band for three hours then we have to look at making adjustments to be able to accommodate that because technically they would be going on stage at nine o'clock if i am not supposed to be taking the stage until nine o'clock to conduct a live and i have six items to sell that's 18 minutes then you see where your money investment in your entertainment is getting cut down and apart and so I don't want that. So the idea is that we want to get all of our fundraising done early in the evening and then allow the party to continue after the funds have been collected. That's great. Um, so let's say you have, uh, you've gotten four or five packages for your live auction um, and you know that's still not enough to fill the full 45 minutes. Um, what do you recommend then? Is that where consignment packages usually come in? You know what? I actually, the majority of my clients, when we work on consignment packages, and and, and again, I, I've been doing this for so long, and people know from my other seminars that I teach, is that consignment packages are becoming more important now than they were 20 years ago. And people go, why? And I go, because it's very hard to grow an organic package. And if your organization is blessed with it, then that's great. I am so thankful that you still have those resources. But even within those resources, there's limitations and you do not have the ability to duplicate typically or sell. And when I say that, maybe you do have a family or a, a business sponsor that has a home in Park City and maybe you can sell it twice. But can you sell it six times? I mean, and that's typically what happens to me on the consignment package side is that, you know, we look to one, do we have the resources within the development, the special event team to secure five, seven, eight strong packages for the live? If not, maybe they're able to secure three and we consider two consignment packages. It, there has to be a balance. Again, a consignment package has to mirror the desire and the ability to spend that the audience has. And so if I know that... Oh. My survey, four board members said they wanted to go to Italy and the committee said, oh, my gosh, I'd love to go to Italy. And we find a great Italy package. And I know that I have two strong you know, bidders going at it and I can sell it 
make it a profit center for the organization and perhaps sell a third or fourth. I mean, my highest uh, selling of a package was 14 times. Um, I could have wow. never, done, I could have never done that with an organic package. I could have sold it twice, um, but this was just a great price point package. It really appealed to multiple parents that were in my audience. And so it became really fun because, you know, after the sixth or seventh time, I was like, well, who else wants to go? You know, so everybody just right. kind of in and it was fun and it raised a lot of money but then on the back end what's really important when it comes to consignment packages is that uh understanding that after 9 12 18 months two years and prepping for a special event or even if this just all fell in your lap 30 days ago and you're trying to raise money you know so their uh, child can receive cancer treatment is that you need to know that when you hand this off it's taken care of and that's what's so important is to ensure that your guest experience that there is no anxiety no hiccups etc and, and that's why you know many of my clients rely on Winspire uh, in and your team uh, because yep. for me as a professional benefit auctioneer I have to know uh, beyond a shadow of the doubt when I sell it on stage that you're my partner in this process yeah. and I have to know that you know what I'm representing is, is again full transparency uh, to the audience and what their expectations are and you know that there's no fine print that I missed without my readers and so those are just really sure. important things but again you know I also look to consignment packages outside the live and um, I love utilizing them for events with oh gosh doesn't matter how many people but it, it falls into a sweet spot of 200 to 300 guests one of my get one of my events had 125 guests they just ate up a consignment package like candy but we did it as a raffle so you know we had a, an event that basically we had a package that had a cost of three thousand dollars it was you know kind of outside the scope of our life it was it was a bit too nice it had a you know retail opportunity of five to six i didn't think that we could reach it in the live but we wanted to make something really special and so we built it into a raffle and we sold uh, chances a uh, hundred chances at uh, at fifty dollars a piece so we created a five thousand dollar revenue stream and and it created a great it cr created a good profit for us but we needed a low buy-in opportunity for guests that night and so it was a lot of fun and we enjoyed it um, in the live, you know, auction, one of the things that's really nice to be able to do, and, and I know your organization uh, has many of these opportunities at price points that make sense, but maybe I'm selling in the live auction and um, I can offer high bidder's choice, meaning, uh, you know, snow, beach, um, Europe, you know, and so the idea is that if I'm the high bidder, I'll say I'm the high bidder at $6,000 on this package and I choose beach. But then I can look to my backup bidder and say, do you want to go to the mountains or do you want to go to the beach? Well, I want to go to the beach right. too. Well, now I've sold two beaches. Well, then I can have a parent that says, whoa, 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 I want to go to the mountains and I can sell it again. And so the idea is really it's about cross pollinating opportunities that consignment packages allow us to do that organically, organically grown packages sometimes can't. That's great. And let me just say a couple of things, and I appreciate that, Renee, but um, you, you, you touched on selling multiples a lot here. And we've actually, we've recognized that this is such a big revenue earner for uh, nonprofits that we actually just recently rolled out a multiples credit. So we're going to reward nonprofits um, for selling packages multiple times just because it ends up generating so much revenue. So if you sell any one of our packages, um, three or more times, you're going to get a credit that actually increases. So if you sell a package three times, you're going to get a $300 credit that you can use at your next event. If you sell four, you're going to get $700 credit, five, $1,200, and it goes up from there. So the more times you sell a package, the more credits you're going to accrue. And if you get that 14, if you get a package 14 times, you're going to get thousands of dollars in credit that you can use uh, towards your next event. So we're trying to incentivize now profits to, to, to sell packages multiple times because it becomes such a revenue center um, for the live auction. And uh, second second uh, point here is just um, that I always like to touch on is the fact of underwriting, right? You talked about it throughout, but you can get um, you know mobile bidding underwritten, you can get the auctioneer underwritten, you can also get consignment packages underwritten, and it's a great a resource for places like dentists or lawyers, right? If they want some notoriety, they can underwrite the cost of a package and then get recognized in the live auction as if they donated it, right? So, uh, you know, this next experience is, is brought to you by Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and uh, we found that's a really popular option for um, even don't, even in, uh, organizations that have a no consignment policy, right? You can still get those consignment packages in there if you get them underwritten. 
And it's interesting that you bring that up because again, this happened to me last November for one of my clients is that the family had always donated a, a mountain retreat. And, and it was interesting because they, they, they had only sold once and uh but it but the family approached me outside of the development they called my office and said you know what listen we we've, we've always enjoyed donating it but our daughter's graduating and you know there's just circumstances that are changing with regards to their connection to the school and i said well what would you like and she, they said you know what instead of it being our home we would like to underwrite a package um to something like type and similar uh just let us know what the cost would be and i said cool. and so and so it made all the difference. But see, it took the they still wanted to support the organization. It's just they didn't want the personal connection of being, you know, uh, you know, having to coordinate what week and the cleaning right. service and all these things that came to it. And, and again, like I said, life circumstances can take an organic package donor uh, out of the system. But instead of losing them all together, reach out to them and see if they'll underwrite something similar. Totally. Yep. It's a great tool. Um, last slide here, and I, I want to use this slide um, to talk about two things, and then we're going to get to questions. Uh, first and foremost, um, you know, what recommendations do you have for hiring a professional auctioneer? How, how can people hire you? And third, and uh, I, I really wanted to, I feel like we kind of missed an opportunity to talk about the direct appeal uh, and the funding and how important that is. So um, I don't know what you want to address first, but uh, I'm going to let you take the floor. I actually discussing the fund of need is a priority for me. It's it's something that is a cornerstone of my organization, and I teach benefit auctioneers around the world. I also teach MCs and television personalities and all the people that try to pretend to be an auctioneer uh, how to do this as well. And they're well intentioned, and God bless them. But you know, for me, uh, raising money that's a straight donation. Another reason why it's so important, but another reason why is that what we're seeing in uh, professionals that are attending our event and this is something we have not seen in a decade plus is the return of the corporate match and we are seeing it more and more and we're printing out more and emailing more secondary receipts post event because individuals that are donating 250 250 to 500 dollar range are being able to get matched by their employer and i think that is an incredible trend to see it back but the importance of the fund to need, and maybe Ian will have to have a conversation that's specifically on how to build the fundamentals to ensure yeah. a successful fund to need, because you know one fifth of our audience today doesn't currently utilize this, yet it it generates seventy percent of our live um, event fundraising the night of a gala on average now uh, fund and need smashes every record so paddles up program you know it used to be donation cards on table you can utilize mobile bidding auctioneer with bid cards i believe peer to peer is so much more important and more successful but the idea is that you can set it to any level you want and for people that are interested in this we can we can speak off topic or i think ian we, you and i probably should have another conversation about it because it's an hour in itself I, I teach this through the association of fundraising professionals because it is recognized as the go-to uh game changer for nonprofit special events and so whether it's a large event and you're looking but i always say you know you look to someone asked in a, in a client call this morning they're like well what's your standard ask levels you know, well, it could be 5,000, 2,500, 1,000, 500, 250, and 100 can be your last level. Uh, for smaller events, it could be 1,000, 500, 250, 150. And with mobile bidding technology, we have the ability to create a tab that you can donate at any level. And so it could be $5, doesn't matter. Every dollar matters. And building whatever our, our goal is for that night financially. But, you know, to talk about it, you know, extensively is that the idea is that we want to apply social math to this portion of the event. We want to give guests a visual as to uh, the power of their dollars and what can be constructed, rebuilt, uh, redesigned, improved um, and acquired, you know, because some of my organizations, you know, are, are still seeking smart boards. So a $10,000 mm -hmm. underwrite full board, 5,000 half a board, 2,500 is a quarter of a board. And people laugh, but it's fun. Four people come together, we bought another board. You know, for scholarships for a community college here in Illinois, it's $3,200 a semester. Will you support a student and fund a scholarship for that semester, 3,200, 1,800? You can see how you can divide it down. You know, who wouldn't want to support 25% of a, a non-traditional student to return to school? I mean, it's just fun. You know, you make it lighthearted. We deal with 
some incredible, um, at times, overwhelming uh, topics that are associated with our mission and vision of our organizations. And, you know, having a video, having a survivor, yeah. having an advocate for the organization speak. These are all things that are groomed into a 12 to 18 minute program. I think it is worthy of our time to, to dedicate an hour, uh, you know, in the future to talk about it with your um, audience. Yeah. I, love to. I, think, I think it's it, a great idea. In fact, it's a game we should schedule some. Yeah. And, and it's a game changer and it's something that I strongly advocate for. The fund and need is uh, my priority at many events over the live auction to allow more time to uh, provide inclusiveness for the entire audience. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the fund and need does is that it allows everyone to participate and support an organization at a financial level that they're comfortable with. And then to touch on that it, 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 for another, wow, scratch your head moment is that at many of my clients over the last five years, we've shifted it from a one-time donation of X to a sustained donation. So the idea is that instead of receiving you know, I'll say $500 that, you know, we have them donate $60 a month, you know, $50 yep. a month, you know, see what I'm saying? Where instead of it's a one time, yep. you know, so if it's a $500 yep. gift, I ask you for $50 a month for a year, I have $600. I've gained a hundred dollars in changing your ask into something that perhaps your budget could take a little bit better than a one time ask. And so sustained giving is very important for me from the stage. It's something that more of my clients and, and more of the people that I'm teaching are moving to, especially in the lower, uh, smaller do, uh, denominations, because it allows someone to become a sustained giver. We get to touch them a minimum of 12 times a year. We have better communication with them and they're stronger advocates for us moving forward. I love it. All right. Last but not least, we're going to get some questions. Um, how should people go about hiring a professional benefit auctioneer? How would they go about hiring you if they're interested? Well, I would love to work with, I have an incredible team of auctioneers that work with me that uh, have won multiple awards and have designations and incredible accolades, but um, they, uh, you know, we like to work with people that are like ourselves and they are strong advocates for our nonprofit clients and we work in all 50 states. I'm licensed in every state that you can be licensed in the United States. And I hold many municipal licenses as well. And I'm bonded where I need to be bonded and carry general liability insurance. But I think that when it comes to hiring a professional auctioneer, start with the basics. Are they a licensed auctioneer? You know, in, in the state that you reside in, is there a licensed law that requires auctioneers to be licensed? And if there is, make sure they're licensed. Ask for their license number go onto the website for the licensing body and see if they've had any complaints. I mean, these are all things that are very important to follow up on. If you're in a state such as California, where it doesn't require licensing, but requires bonding, it's very fair to ask, you know, for my clients, when they reach out to me, well, before their clients, I can refer to all of my people as clients, but when someone is calling to interview me and they ask for references, I give them the last five events that I've conducted. I don't have a set list of references because there's no one in our industry that's going to give you a bad reference. I mean, in, in nonprofit overall. And so I like to be able to provide them with perhaps a client organization that has just hired me in the last year to 18 months. And then that way that development peer can ask the other, why did you hire? Why did you make a change? And then I look to someone I've conducted a recent event, maybe three to five years of involvement. And why do you keep her? You know, what does she bring to the table every year? And then for my long term clients, which are 15 year plus, I, I have a, a, a strong group of clients that are two decade plus now with me and my organization. And I'm just honored to be their advocates every day. I'm very thankful for my involvement with each and every one of them is that, you know, what makes the difference? How do you keep it fresh? And uh, and so those are all things to ask. But you know, to me, I look to professional association membership. I look to uh, any form of advanced degrees and uh, certifications and and commitments to the nonprofit industry that they've served and uh, and, and serve and solicit. Um, and so I think it's really about ensuring a good fit. 
and, and knowing because there may be an organization I'm not the right fit, but I do know someone that would be the right fit. And and our goal from an auctioneering consultant side is really about securing the proper advocate for that special event. It's really it's not yeah. about big calling. These are things that can't be phoned in from the stage. They have to understand the mission and vision of the organization, your budget, what your revenue goals are, and, and the plus and minuses. There's a political battlefield going on in every nonprofit event. Anybody tells you otherwise, they just got into the nonprofit world because there's always something or someone we have to be mindful of at a special event. And it's important for your auctioneer to be a member of that team year round. You don't need a hired gun that just shows up and calls bids and leaves. You need an advocate that understands the demographics, the financial goals, and the stress that you're under to where they can take some of that burden to where you can actually enjoy your event. I love it. And yeah, if you, if any of you out there are, are looking for a referral uh, for an auctioneer in your area, um, uh, both Renee and, and myself uh, would be happy to provide you uh, with some of our, you know, recommended auctioneers uh, that, that are absolutely skilled and, and can be excellent uh, at your next event. Um, if you are interested in, in getting in touch with Renee um, about, you know, auctioneering your event, but also just in general uh, with questions, you can reach her at Renee at ReneeJones.com or, or check out her website. And there, there's that phone number as well. So um, she's been gracious enough to, uh, to, to provide that. And if you guys have any questions, you can reach directly after her. Did you want to say anything else um, before I kind of wrap this up and get to questions? No, I think I know I've got my homework assignment of the forms that I want to get over to you and uh, and we'll set a date for us to talk about how to structure a successful uh, fund and need call to action program. Uh, we'll have to pick a holiday for us to celebrate together. <laughs> We've done Valentine's Day. I think March 17th, though, I think is a weekend or we're going to be too busy in fundraising season. Exactly. Right? We'll have to look to later this yeah. year for that, but uh, we'll definitely get it yeah. done. But no, you know, I'm, Black I'm an, yeah. Fourth of July. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm an advocate for the industry and I, I work, uh, you know, I, I'm a contributor on many of the Facebook pages for our development leadership and, and any of my clients and, and AFP peers can share with you is that I, I love what I do. I wake up and it's what I do every day. And uh, so anything that I can do to help an event, large or small, um, is I absolutely will assist you any way I possibly can because my consultation over the phone is free. The conversation is free and I will at least be able to point you in the right direction and empower you with the proper tools to grow your event. I love it, Renee. And thank you so much for sharing our, all your knowledge here today. There's just, I feel like we just scratched the surface on all these topics. So uh, I'm going to take you up on that on doing a second uh, conversation webinar uh, here in the near future. So, um, Thank you for that. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about our consignment travel packages for both the live and silent auction or your or raffle, uh, please get in touch with us. You can check out our full catalog at winspireme.com. Uh, the phone number is also there. Um, we're doing a giveaway. So uh, we're giving away a $2,100 cruise package uh, to a lucky Winspire News blog subscriber. Uh, so check it out, winspireme.com backslash giveaway. Uh, the drawing will take place on April 1st of this year. So uh, check that out. I also wanted to direct people, we, we actually have a, um, a podcast uh, called Events with Benefits. We actually just uh, interviewed Renee. Uh, Danny Hooper had a fabulous conversation with her uh, recently, and her her episode is coming up here on March 12th, so look for that. It was a, another great uh, hour packed with uh, with just great tips. So uh, wherever you get your podcast, search Events with Benefits, and uh, I think we have about 40 episodes out there all about uh, you know running effective fundraising events. With that, um, I'm going to get to some questions here. We have some great ones. If you have any questions uh, that have been kind of lingering on your tongue, now's the time to type them in, and we'll get to a few of them here. Um, let's see. Chad Hoffman says, we have a raffle, heads and tails, dessert auction, live auction, silent auction, and we're planning a fund and need two. Is that too much? I would say, I mean, that's, that's most events. What do you think? That is a lot of moving parts, but based upon your timeline, you can space it out accordingly to, to ensure success. 
I would just remind uh, you to be mindful to state raffle and IRS restrictions on 501c3s with regards to how many activities you can have in a calendar year. Just be mindful to mm. uh, those kind of res possible restrictions. But uh, wow, you do have a lot of moving parts and dessert auction. Those are so fun. Uh, but the main thing is, is be mindful of what's your return on investment and time in your overall program. What you sell those desserts for, is that going to be equal to having a professional auctioneer handle and ask? You know, it's, it's weighing it plus or minuses. But if you want to discuss it offline, just drop me an email. We'll talk about it. I can take you through the plus and minuses of each component. But there's also a way probably to build 15 minutes into an early arrival and make it all spaced out to where it doesn't feel so congested. That's great. Thanks for that, Chad. Angela Ferguson, how do you get board members who have paid for their ticket to an event to see themselves as a working representative rather than a regular guest uh, there to have a good time? Oh, the mission and vision focused of our, uh, we sometimes have to check the pulse of some of our board members. I'm a board member, so I, uh, I deal with the non-response all the time. Um, a board member, I think a lot of it has to do with the responsibility of the executive committee. Um, and the board overall and under the direction of the executive uh, director to be able to communicate what the, what our goals are at the event. Uh, many times I bribe my board members by saying, you know what, we're looking for new board members. We're looking to uh, fill empty seats with qualified individuals, uh, people that are invested in our organization and the event is considered an outreach. And so we'd like for you to visit with these key people. Uh, sometimes I reach out to board members more in an ego position of I tell them that here are our top 10 tables and donors for the night. I uh, appreciate you making your way over there with the photographer to take photos. I typically do that with the board president and the vice president. Um, there's a lot of ways that I put people in motion uh, to benefit my development team where they don't know that I'm actually putting them to work, if that makes sense. Uh, if not, drop me a note because there are there are certain briberies that I do for board members uh, to get them in motion. But, you know, I'm just happy, you know, Angela, that you've got board members that buy tickets. Um, you know, we would love all board members to buy tables. Uh, but I actually had a board member reach out to me the other day and ask if they could sit at my table because they didn't even want to make the investment in the two hundred and fifty dollars for two tickets. And so mm -hmm. that's that's tough to process. That actually moves over to more of an operational concern that I have for the organization that you're working with, because how disengaged is your board? You have to look at attendance, participation, your give, get, and uh, there's ways that we can tweak it. I'm very good at putting that carrot on a stick in front of a board member and making them work. Love it. That's great. Um, thank you for that. Uh, up next, we got Courtney Schmackers. Uh, there are a lot of good things here for what to do. What are the top three things to avoid at a fundraising event? Overconsumption of alcohol. Yep. Oh, bad valet lines at checkout. I mean, it's all the simple things that you would never want to experience as a guest. So look for yes, the pitfalls. You know, look for the pitfalls. I always put myself in the position of a guest. I look to the layout of some of these hotels that we go to are cavernous. It's like, where am I going? You know, even if you're on a school campus, you have to remember there's usually one primary parent that's dropping that kid off and where drop off is, is not where we're doing the on campus event. So it's all about signage. And again, get the signs out and then track it. Pretend you're a guest, go through the check-in process, know in your data. If you're doing mobile bidding technology and you don't have anybody's mobile numbers to where you can send out that initiation text to get things started, there's your first problem because it's going to take an extra 10 seconds per guest to get them checked in on average. And so there's all these little things that you just have to tweak to ensure. So it's like, what's the flow for check-in? Please, please move away from the A to D and the E to G and the alphabet. Have them go to any available station. You know that based upon certain demographics, you could have a line at the J's, the M's, the P's, and nobody over in the A's and the B's. So let people go to check in wherever they have an open station. Eliminate the lines. You know, having a program that concise, if you know that your speakers are out of control and can't be respectful to a three to five minute uh, time on stage, then film them in advance and then have them wave from the side stage and do photographs off stage. Again, it's where you lose time. Look for those opportunities to be able to cut your timeline down 
to where you can get to having fun after we've raised all the money we can extract from the room. Love it. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, we're just going to do a couple more here and then, um, and then we're going to call it good. Um, one from Peg. If you put a label on the gift card, are you covering up the information the winner may need? Do you have any concerns about that? Uh, most gift cards I'm, I'm aware of uh, usually have the brand or some sort of coding on the front. That's where you suggest putting the car, the uh, information, correct? You put, you put the label on top of the word Starbucks. Everybody at Starbucks they, knows it's Starbucks. <laughs> you know, you want to be I able, love it. You just want to be able to hit the coin on the back, expose the four digit code and move on with life. But no, we always put it on the front. Uh, we want it to be when it's being handed over in a transaction or put into the envelope in a restaurant that it's there, it's visible, and a manager on duty will see it. That's great. Um, this one is from uh, Donna Cedar. I work for a domestic violence shelter. What kind of fund to need could we do? Any ideas? I think that totally depends on what you're raising money for, right? Is the improvements to the shelter, right? It has to be a specific ask, right? A specific um, need, right, that you're asking for. Well, Donna, you know, I serve on a board of a shelter and I can help you offline with that. But just in general, to those that are on the call that are that are helping in specific needs like that, it can be uh, in, in ranging from emergency extraction of, of a domestic abuse uh, victim, you know, being able to get them out immediately with their children to safety. It can be in levels of what does it cost to provide counseling group or individual. Uh, relocation, getting it down to even the clothes, you know, as well as I do, if they're lucky enough to leave with a trash bag and their child and maybe their pet, if they're lucky, right. you know, we've expanded out on that quite a bit. I touched on pets. One of the programs that we had is many times people stay in abusive relationships because of their children or their pets. If they know that there is a fostering program that can hold their pet until they get back on their feet, they'll leave their abuser faster. So Donna, please reach wow. out to me. I, I work with many organizations. We have refined the ask to a science, and I believe that we can drop it right into your program. I love it. I love it. Okay, cool. Two, two more. One from Kate Balsam. Uh, do it. Hi, Renee. So, so that was uh, while you were talking about how to hire an auctioneer. And then um, let's see here. Last Thanks, one. Kate. This one's from. Kate. Go ahead. I said, thank you, Kate. Speak a little oh, louder into the mic. Yeah, that's a nice endorsement. Just hire. <laughs> There you go. And then last one, this one's from uh, Wendy uh, Limbertai. What is the best time of year to hold a fundraiser? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. It, it's a multiple tier to answer is that we know that October and November and February, March, April, you know, these are jam packed dates, weekends, specific causes. You know, if you're anything that's associated with breast cancer, you know, October is your month. And anybody else that tries to 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 fight that 800 pound gorilla in that market space, it's really tough to hear get your voice heard. Um, you need to look to when your like type uh, organizations are conducting their events and, and do it before them. That's my most honest answer that I can provide you is be ahead of the game. I work with a, many, many clients and my goal is very specific is in a, in a snowstorm. All you see is the snow. You want your event to be an individual snowflake. You want it to shine in its individual personality and beauty. And so many times with organizations, I work with them to negotiate space on Thursday nights instead of Friday or Saturday nights. If you're a Saturday night, yeah. consider moving to a consider to move to a Thursday. Uh, it allows you to have a more concise timeline. It reduces your overall expenses because hotels are empty on those nights from events. And so you're not competing against a large organization that, you know, has a bar bill more than your annual budget. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I look to best fit. I look to unique venues. I don't stick to traditional sites. I look to things that are more identifiable to the community that I serve based upon comfort level and dress and demographic of who's going to attend. But, you know, we're seeing more and more where events are happening in September, where I'd say 10 years ago that didn't happen. But now we have more September. We have a few in August. I don't recommend it. It's too hot in most places and kids are in camp and others. And so then also January, we never, ever saw things moving into the first week of January until the last eight to 10 years. Now that's a prominent weekend for us. Right. And so you, you just have to be mindful. Whoever thought that nonprofit fundraisers would be conducted on New Year's Eve. But I have clients that have incredible, successful galas on those nights because it's a it's a captured audience. It's a festive opportunity. 
And uh, it's a great opportunity to, to celebrate a year of accomplishments and looking forward to the next year of challenges. Uh, that's great. I think that's a great note to finish up. One last thing Kate just said. She said, in all seriousness, a professional auctioneer made a huge difference for us. So uh, kudos to you, Renee. Kudos to you, Kate. Um, and thank you, Renee, for sharing all of your incredible knowledge here today. This is not going to be the last time uh, you all see Renee. She's going to come back. Uh, we're going to have another fun uh, holiday-themed uh, webinar all about maybe fun and needs and a couple other things. So look forward to that. Thank you again, Renee, so much for coming on and spending your time here today. It was an absolute pleasure. Well, I appreciate the invitation and your consideration to host this uh, for our audience today. And I look forward to having another holiday. I, I told you earlier this morning, we need to have a fun with flags. You'll be my Sheldon. There you go. And we'll do an October. Uh, we're going to do one in Halloween costumes where you can actually see us on, on video. We'll, we'll oh have some fun God. with that. I'll be ready for that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, take care, everyone. Uh, happy fundraising and, uh, and be blessed. All right. Have a happy Valentine's Day out there and uh, we'll see you next time, everyone. Thank you.